Please raise out your right hand if you would. Heavenly Father, as these ladies just told us, and we love to, their testimony, they love you ev with everything they've got. We love you, Lord, with everything we've got. I love my wife and I love these people, love everybody. And we ask you to bless, Lord, now this as it goes out for television. Uh, bless the people who see it and may it be a blessing in their lives. Anoint this, O oh Lord. It's a difficult subject, but anoint it and bring peace and wisdom to everybody concerned. Holy Spirit, you're the porter. Open truth to us today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We're glad to have you on board. Glad to have you watching this telecast. This is a little different this time. I'm not preaching, as you say, but there's teaching as my wife, my dear wife, Mooring of 56 years has joined me, and the subject today will be what the Bible teaches on marriage, divorce, remarriage, relationships, and families, and all that kind of broad subject. And I think, honey, if it's all right, I'll jump in with this first one here, and, and we'll try to describe what it says, and then we can talk about it, and hope that it makes sense to the people. Uh, and I'm not necessarily taking them in order here. One of the questions is, what's the difference between fornication and adultery? The Bible does use both terms, fornication and adultery. And fornication sometimes is used in a broad sense, any kind and every kind of immorality. That could be put under the title of fornication. But more specifically, it's used relating to people who are not married having sexual relationships. Uh, that's strictly forbidden. If, if for, let, let's just say uh, a fellow and his girl are going to be married. They're not married, but they're going to be, let's say they're engaged, and they uh, engage in uh, intercourse uh, sexually. The Bible condemns that in the fiercest way. Uh, don't let her near your bed until the wedding night because the Bible says, and listen to this, it actually says not only it's fornication, it says fornicators will have no part in the kingdom of God. You'll lose everything if you get into that. Premarital sex, it's sometimes called. But the Bible calls it fornication. Paul uses it several times, and most every time, he uses it relating to unmarried people uh, having, let's just say it, sexual intercourse. Now, what would it be if a person who is married has an affair and has that sexual intercourse with somebody else? Then that's adultery. It looks like it's the same sin, but the Bible uses two different words. One is fornication, usually for uh, the unmarried, and then adultery uh, for the person who is married and who's been unfaithful to his wife, or vice versa, the wife's been unfaithful to the husband and having an affair outside. Do you want to comment on that, honey? But also, I think, in this so much today, that nobody thinks anything off before marriage, sleeping with somebody, but it starts you off on a wrong foot. It starts you off that it's all out of balance, the whole thing, and it'll never get right unless you get saved and you ask God's forgiveness and then start anew, but it starts you off on the wrong foot. And usually down the road, it doesn't work out. No, you, you want the blessing of God on your marriage. And why don't you do it God's way? I tell our grandchildren regularly, God's way is the best way. Our relationship, we're not trying to uh, hold it up as, as something perfect. Uh, but really, we've tried to honor God all these years, before and after marriage. And you put God first. And when you put God first and do it His way, then the blessing is on you. And as I said earlier, you can say the lines have fallen onto me in pleasant places. But God is very serious, not only about adultery, but about fornication. And uh, it has to be, re metanoia is the Greek word, uh, and it simply means if you're, if you're going this direction, 
180 degrees, you've got to go that direction. You've got to change. Repentance doesn't mean penance. It means change and go the opposite direction. Stop it. Stop what you're doing. As, as Maureen has just said, ask the Lord for forgiveness. And, uh, and then when you do get married, that's a different thing. But handle it right. You know, I don't think there's any perfect marriage. I don't think there's any perfect kids. I don't think there's any perfect grandkids. None of us are perfect. We all make mistakes, no matter who you are. You would be lying if you say, oh, your marriage has been perfect. No, it's not perfect. We do the best we can, and we try to put God first, but no, nobody's perfect. And I think, you know, when we got married at first, one of the greatest things to have is gratefulness and thankfulness to the Lord for what you have. I can't explain it because everything is so materialistic today. When we got married, we had nothing. We had no bank account. We had no money. And we come from ordinary working class family homes. We didn't have much. But when we got married, we lived in his mother's house. We were happy. Then a little house around the next street came up for rent. And we got the house, and it was at the end of a row of streets. And I mean, you could, each arm could each touch each wall in the house. It was so small. It was old. The railroad track was at the far end. But you know, I was so happy in that place. I scrubbed those floors. I had that place shining. I thank God for that place. And you know, I think when you do that, when you have an attitude of gratitude for things, when you know God, when you don't have anything much, but you find gratitude in what you have to God and say, thank you, Lord. I was so happy in that place. I don't think I was any happier than what I am now. I was just as happy as can be. Bought secondhand furniture, furnished the place, but it was mine. And I was so grateful to the Lord. And oftentimes I think as you go through life, God gives you more things as you go along. But I think if you thank him for the good things in your marriage, what you have, a loving husband, a nice home, even if it is a miserable place, it, you've got a roof over your head. I think that goes a long way in marriage. Well, well, sure it does. And remember this, friends, you cannot buy a Cadillac on a Ford salary. You can't do it, especially at the beginning of your marriage. Don't, because you want a nice home and nice furniture, if you can't afford it, don't buy it. I remember when we did get a nicer home, this one in Ben Madigan, and uh, there was a perfect place just as you're kind of coming through the door for like a chandelier. And uh, we waited for over a year with just a bulb in the ceiling, nothing else, a bulb, until we had enough money. And I remember how much it was, 108 pounds to buy that chandelier. And then you enjoy it. But if you get yourself into debt right away so heavy, my goodness, you're so burdened, that in itself will undermine your marriage. So watch your dollars and cents. Here's two other things, too, that I'd like to say. Not only in marriage, this is in life, the two most critical things, and Maureen actually touched on one of them. Learn the secret of say-so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Spend time getting God's word into your heart and into your soul. That's the first one. The second one is always have an attitude of gratitude. Don't be miserable, always complaining about everything, but thank the Lord and praise the Lord. And you, because you live in America, are millionaires in comparison to most of the rest of the world. And if you can't be happy and praise the Lord in Florida, you're not going to be able to do it in heaven even. So be very wise uh, in, 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 in your uh, dealings with God and with life. And here it is again, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Make it a goal that you're going to get God's word into you. It'll become such a strength for the rest of your life. I mean, we spend so much time in watching TV or doing other things. Get God's word in you and develop, as Maureen called it, an attitude of gratitude. And, and we were so. kind of both. I was raised in the Nazarene church, and we always knew we were always it wasn't even a second thought for us to go to church every sunday i know i'm digressing a bit but That's okay. i mean you never miss church and you you just never did that you never and you never missed tithing i remember tithing my mother and father would give me pocket money on a friday night probably 
I don't know, 50 cents here, maybe. I tithed out of that. All my life, whatever I had, I got my candy or whatever I wanted, but I always knew that a tenth of that had to go into the offering. God honors that. I mean, you say, oh, that's nothing. I believe when you tithe and when you give to the Lord, not to get something, just because he tells you to do it, then he blesses you. I'm digressing, but I shouldn't be. How true. I remember on that subject, when we arrived in America, we arrived not here, as probably you know, we arrived in Kissimmee, which is right beside Disney World. And we had wonderful meetings. And then Sundays, this family would be missing, or that family. And of course, I didn't know if they were ill or sick or whatever. And I'd contact them. Oh, no, uh, we had friends, and we had to take them to Disney. I couldn't believe it. Don't you know that Disney's open seven days a week? You go to church first. You honor God first. As if it, you better do it. Because God's looking at the small things even. Saying that going to church is a small thing. To see how faithful you are. If you're not faithful in the small things, God will never give you the bigger things to handle. Here is another question. I'm not going to read the scriptures, but they're in your notes. Don't look at them now. This, this is a, an unusual question. I'll, I'll summarize it. What did Paul mean when he said, wives, be submissive to your husbands? Let me preface this by saying this to you ladies. Always remember that I said it. Here it is. Never submit to a jerk. I don't care if he says he's the best Christian in the world. Don't submit to him. What did Paul mean? He said, even as Christ and the church. Wow. As Jesus looked after the church. That's the way the husband has to look after the wife. And when he said submit, let me give you the illustration. Let's say you're walking downtown Tarpon Springs on a hot Summer's day, like today, I think it's over 90 degrees today, and you're walking. And you see a little lady, she seems rather old, in front of you, and she's two heavy suitcases. You can't believe she's dragging these. And you stop, you don't know the woman, but you stop and say, what are you doing? Oh, she said, I'm carrying these suitcases. I only have half a mile to walk to the bus depot. You say, no, 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 let me carry them. I'm walking that way too. She says, no, 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 they're mine. I'll do it. Thank you just the same. You're very kind, but no, I insist. I insist you let me carry them. And there's a friendly little argument goes on there for a bit, and finally she submits, and she lets you carry it. When a wife submits to a husband, Paul's talking about a husband who's a good husband, who has the mind of Christ, and who's doing something for her benefit. You don't submit to somebody who is selfish, who's looking. Most men are selfish. That's the truth. Women have more of a, a heart for a family and, and, and thinking about others. Most men, that doesn't always apply in every situation, but most of them think about number one and nobody else. They want to be the first rat in the race, and who wants to be a first rat? But that's, that's men, to tell you the truth. But... Uh, uh, you submit to a man who is doing things to bless you because you're the queen in his life. Just like the church submits to Jesus. Why? Because he's going to do something bad to us. We're glad to submit to our Savior because he's going to look after us for time and eternity. Paul said that's the way a wife ought to submit to her husband because she knows that he loves God, he's doing what's right, and he's going to look after her. Go ahead. Well, for instance, when Leslie is praying about something and he feels the Lord has told him to do some a big thing, not a little thing, a big thing, a big thing like buying a building or doing stuff like that, I know he knows better than me to find the will of God in his life. And I submit to that. I don't fight him on it. I don't. Sometimes they say, what? How are we going to do that? But I don't really fight him on it. I submit to him and let him do what God has told him to do. And knowing the end, it will fit, that it will work out for my benefit. 
but there's a difference between submit and control. And that is a whole big difference thing. There's a lot of men want control. If Leslie was to say to me, you can't go to the mall, you can't go out today, you gotta do this, heck no, I'm not gonna submit to that. That's a controlling person. And I, maybe it's my Irish, I don't know. But I would not, I would do, I would go out deliberately just so that he wouldn't say that to me. <laughs> I mean, there's sometimes he'll say to me, where are you going? Out. Well, where are you going? I don't know. Well, where, you do know where you're going. I don't know. Well, I just don't care to tell you where I'm going. <laughs> and that's the difference in control. And a lot of times, men will try to control, control the money control because they're bringing the bread, especially, for, I have to say this, especially for ladies that are at home with children and they have to go ask their husbands for some money. That gets me. That really bothers me. It's their money, both monies. And she shouldn't have to go and beg for $20 to go get groceries. That should be her, hers to take just as much as any, as his. That is, that is a control thing, and there's a lot of that, and there's a lot of men control a lot of things, and their wives, sometimes now, there's some women crazy, and will go out and spend a big bunch, bunch of money if they had it and something stupid. That's a different thing entirely, but I'm talking a person that lives normal every day. I think that there's a lot of control with a man, and that's, that's not submission. That's control, and that's wrong. That's... that's, that's Perfect answer. One of the questions here is, what are the grounds for divorce? I don't know if you've ever uh, witnessed this, perhaps not, if you're watching TV. I'm not a sports person, but sometimes you're going through the channels and you see, let's say, the, the Tampa Bay Bucks, they're playing, and somebody's holding up a T. Somebody else along a little bit's holding up an A, M, P, A. They're spelling out Tampa Bay Bucks. If you only see part of that, you don't get the message. And in the Bible, you must not only see part of it. The Bible says, Peter speaking, no scripture is of any private interpretation. That means you cannot build a doctrine on one scripture. You've got to have other scriptures who will back it up, who will agree with it so that you have a broad idea of what God is talking about. Let me tell you this. If you listen way back in Genesis to God's idea about marriage and divorce and then go into Deuteronomy and read what Moses says and then go on forward and read what Jesus says and then go on forward and read what Paul says, it looks like they're all contradicting each other. It, lo it looks almost ridiculous. It's just the way regarding, say, the Holy Communion or the, the ministry of the gifts of the Spirit. Jesus hardly dealt with it, just a little bit. He left it to Paul to fill it out. So we'll have to read the full, the full thing. And when you read the full thing, here's what you find. Adultery is obviously grounds for divorce, but there's something else. And this other thing is called Paul's principle, or Paul's exception sometimes it's called. The Pauline exception, Pauline, their meaning uh, Paul. And this is where the word abuse comes in. If a man abuses a woman physically, you ought to allow him to do it only once. That's it, get out of there. If it's physical abuse. But if it's not physical abuse, and it goes on to verbal abuse. Sometimes that can be even worse. Verbal abuse, always finding fault, always nagging, always angry, always in a temper. Paul says, let him go. Paul said that. Clearly it's in your notes. Don't look it up now, but it's in your notes. Because he said, God has called us unto peace. In other words, though your home may not be perfect tranquility all the time. After all, we're human. On the other hand, it doesn't have to be a war zone all the time. That's the truth. It's a terrible thing. You know, again, I, I, I'm going to blame men on most of this. You know one thing that's obnoxious? A 
man that can go to work in the morning. Oh, and he, he walks into the office. Oh, good morning, Harry. Good morning, Billy. Good morning, Tom. Everybody thinks he's a great fellow. And he's coming home at night and he sees some of the neighbors. Oh, good, good evening, Mary. He's, he's a great fellow. Until he crosses the threshold of his door and then he becomes a raging bear. The children run from him. The wife cowers from him. That's disgusting, especially if he's naming the name of Jesus. And I am telling you categorically that the Pauline exception tells us not only for adultery, but for abuse. Not only physical abuse, verbal abuse. Now, we're not trying to break up a marriage if there's one argument. But if this is the MO of that, the, the, the modus operandi, if he, th this is the way he lives and operates. Paul says it's grounds for divorce. Let him go. You are called unto peace, and you've only got one life. And you, Paul said, and I'll elaborate a little bit on it, Paul said, well, you may say, no, I'm going to stay and suffer all this because I, I think I can still win them. Paul says, how do you know you're going to win them? You may never win them. Ruin your life. Have years of torment and ministry without any knowledge other than your hope so -ism that you're going to win them. Take my advice, Paul says, and forget it. If abuse gets to the point, especially in front of children, Paul said that is grounds for divorce as well as adultery. Yeah, and I think that a big thing too with your home and to not just blaming the man on that. For women, I think if you're at home, especially if you're not working out, but if you're at home every day, there's no reason why your home can't be clean. There's no reason why there can't be food on the table. There's no reason that things can be tidied up. You have your part to play in making that home a peaceful place. Sometimes, you, especially with younger people, maybe that's true, maybe it's the way we were raised, but your place is, your home is your palace and you look after it and you keep it clean. Some men come home to a mess, no dinner, no clothes washed, nothing. They come, that's not fair either from the man's point of view. That's not fair either. Women have a responsibility to do those things too and to make that home a peaceful place and peaceful for your children when they go to school and when they come home again and just peaceful in the home. And, it, you know, there's small arguments you can have and there's, you can say things to people. I have to say something. In all the years we've been married, in 56 years, Leslie has never once in front of me ever, ever, ever admired another woman. Never once. Not once. Never said, oh, on television, oh, she's good looking. Or, no, never once. And, and it, it gives me such reassurance that I know I'm not much to look at, but I know he thinks I'm good looking or whatever it is, and he's got eyes for only me. And I think that's a big thing in marriage now. People think they can say to each other, oh, he looks terrific or she looks terrific and so on, and doesn't think it hurts the person. In some ways, it does hurt the person. At the end of the day, they don't feel they're not like those people. And I think that has got a lot to do with, that's not an argument, but it goes deep into your being. Things like that. Can I tell them what I told you a few days ago? When no. You talk? Can I? No. Please, can I tell you? No. Can I I'm tell sorry. the people? Well, we'll leave it to them. Would you like to hear it or not? Oh, it's the stupidest thing. We talked about this not admiring I some, burst out laughing some at girl him. that walks by. You don't do that in front of your wife. And when Maureen said to me, uh, thank you for never doing that, and I simply said to her. Oh, this is good. Uh, <clears throat> I said, when you're used to caviar, who wants hamburger? <laughs> I had to laugh out of my head. I said, don't tell that to the people, whatever you do. <laughs> when a person has multiple marriages, which spouse will they know oh, in heaven? heaven? Does it matter? Well, <laughs> when we get to heaven, we're not going to marry or be given in marriage we will have bodies that are different than these. They will be glorified bodies like his is. They will last for all eternity. And we will not have sexual relationships like we have here. The angels don't have that either. And neither will we. 
So you don't need to worry about that. Is it important for families to have prayer time together? Let us go back to Belfast for just a minute. I don't say this for any reason other than it's true. I was very well known in Belfast, in Ireland. Our name was in the newspaper regularly, not just because of church, but no matter what we did. And I remember even the police coming to me and educating me. For example, when I'm driving down the road and there's a motorcycle close to me, what to do to avoid being assassinated. That's the kind of world we lived in. And we find it not only a joy, but an absolute necessity that we have the prayer time. Because a family altar will alter the family. And what we did was I would get up early for a prayer time. We lived on the side of a mountain close to the zoo, and I used to go for a run and then come back in time, get morning and the children up, and we would have breakfast. And then we stayed in the kitchen, which was at the back of the house, uh, for prayer. We joined hands, each of our children. And they were all wonderful children and still are, by the way. And we would have prayer together then. Uh, while they stayed in the kitchen, I would come out, go down the steps, and examine my car. I had to do it every day. I had to get underneath the front of it, not fully underneath, but look underneath what you call the hood, we called the bonnet, make sure there was no bombs attached during the night. Do the same at the back, make sure there was no bombs, and then go. And many times, not every day, but many days, at the bottom of our driveway, there was a British Army Land Rover with four soldiers, and they escorted us to school. I never told the children why, obviously, but the reason was that my name had come up on an assassination list that night, and they were there to protect us. And I still remember when we got to the school, let the children off. The soldiers would salute me, and I would salute them. That was a whole lot to tell you. It's absolutely vital to have the family altar. Pray we together. We needed to pray then. We needed to pray too, right? And also, it's a great thing too to have Holy Communion in your home. Uh, you know, for the first 200 years of church history, they had no church buildings. Everything was in the home. So they had Holy Communion in the home on a regular basis. And even if you're on your own, you can still serve yourself Holy Communion. And that should be part of the family altar and is a great thing to do. You want to comment on that, honey? Here's, uh, let me see. Let me see, let me see. What is the secret to your happy and blessed marriage? Can a marriage recover after an affair? The answer is yes. The problem is when it's affair after affair after affair after affair. It damages trust and it's very, very hard to do and it gets harder each time. But because of the wonderful grace of God and the power of God and the forgiving spirit of the injured party, of course it can recover and go on to be something wonderful. And we encourage that. But that's nothing to be pled with. Nothing to be pled with because it damages trust. And when that happens, that's absolutely awful. Uh, this is an unusual one. How can I help a family member who is depressed and feeling suicidal? Do you want to mention that one, honey? I'll speak in a minute about it. There. Yeah, I'll read it again. How can I help a family? It's all about families. By the way, we won't keep you too much longer, but how can a family member who is depressed and feeling suicidal? The main thing, I think, is to talk to them. Talk to them and talk to them and let them talk to you and tell them to get in God's word and start. Leslie has a sermon on Say So saying God's word, what God can do for you, what you, he has done for you, and repeating the scriptures every day and, and just helping them all you can. I mean, there's nothing you can do. You only let people talk and, and ask the Lord, you pray to, and ask the Lord to deliver them and set their mind free and just 
praise God the whole way through it and help them and talk to them. There's such suicides in America today that the, the, the number is going up, including among young people. If, if, if every one of you were to come forward and I was to give you $5 million each, that's nothing in comparison to what I'm telling you to do with these two things. Number one, we're back to it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You've got to take time. Every week, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes a day, or, or every few days, get into your own room and write out the scriptures. I am strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. This will do better than any therapist you can ever meet, and I'm not against them. Better than any of these fancy drugs they give. I am strong in the Lord and the power of his might. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When I was delivered years ago from mental bondage, which came about because of a stupid pastor uh, preaching negative stuff, when I was delivered, then God showed me how to keep my deliverance, and it was by the principle of say so. Say so, say what you are in Christ. Plus, the second one is, we're back to it again. An attitude of gratitude. Get away from, ah, oh, it's horrible, this old job, this old car I've got. Thank God you've got a car. Yeah. I mean, thank God. Get for a what backbone. You... Pardon Get me? a backbone. Right. A lot of people, it's these little things, and we hear it through the church and different churches. Somebody offends them something they've lost some goodness sake think of other people in the state they're in and the countries they live in and they have nothing i'm saying this some leslie and i sometimes we go through little things in our body and we're sore and i have to say some at the end of the time you know what we say paula we look at that lady she's in church every sunday with a smile on her face and an inspiration and a blessing to us. And I, I mean, I love her and I just look at her and I think, why do I complain about a sore throat or complain about anything? And you know, a lot of that has got to do that you just don't look around and see how other people live and what they have and have not. Because God has blessed you so much just for your own life, to give you life. You have, you know, to just not even think of taking suicide or taking your life. You have so much more than most people, you know. That, 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 that is beautiful. Here, this, this, yeah, go ahead. This, this may be, a, we'll see in a moment, but it may be the last one. My husband is very selfish and unthoughtful. I'm so tired of it. What can I do? Again, I go back to nearly the beginning when we started talking about men and women, obviously two different categories. Men more than women are inclined to be self-willed. Uh, I heard about a story that happened in the Middle East. An Arab man was sitting on his donkey and his wife was walking by his side and a tourist came forward and uh, said, excuse me, they were able to con talk to each other in the same language. Excuse me, uh, sir, can I ask you a question? I'm a tourist and I'm, I'm all ears. I want to know what's going on. I said, sure, uh, what do you want to know? Who, who is this lady? Well, that's my wife. She looked very tired and trying to keep up. And uh, the tourist said, well, don't you think it's very unfair that you're riding on the donkey and she's walking? doesn't seem right to me. Is there an explanation? And the man on the donkey said, oh, there is an explanation. The tourist said, what is it? And the man said, well, she doesn't have a donkey. <laughs> that's man. Women can be selfish too, but that's man. We used to sing a little chorus, won't be much longer. In Ireland, honey, you'll remember it. It was to the tune of jingle bells, jingle bells, J-O-Y, J-O-Y, surely that must mean Jesus first, yourself last, others in between, J-O-Y, joy, joy, Jesus first, why, yourself last, oh, others in between. 
And my mother used to pray a prayer, and I heard her many times pray it, Lord, help me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer shall be for others. And I'd just like to finish my remarks unless Ruth Ann, who has just come in, but, you know, wants to come and I'm say something. I was just going to ahead. say in that thought about selfishness and thoughtfulness, there's a lot of times I think when women, they do, for 56, I'll tell you, I'm just being truthful this morning, 56 years I've made a bed, made breakfast, done the dishes, cleaned the house, ironed the shirts. I can go over lots of, I can go over a hundred things I do every day for 56 years. And sometimes I get fed up and I say, oh, for goodness sake, I'm making this bed in the morning again. I have to do it again. I've done it every day for 56 years. And sometimes you think, well, does God really see me? Me, the mother, the wife, just you, you sitting in the audience, does he really see and watch and hear and know what I do? Does he even, as, does my name ever come up? Anything. And you know, you, it's natural, you get tired doing those things sometimes. But you know, when a person, you make a meal for a person and your husband gets up and says, thank you, honey, that was a really nice meal. You feel so good. So you don't mind doing it for 56 years. You don't mind doing that. But there, sometimes I think that women get into a point where they just think, I'm just a woman. I'm just, what do I, what do I matter to this world and world affairs? God's called you to a home and children. That's your calling. And I have said to Leslie many times, I can't preach and talk that good. But you know what? I know what I'm called to do. I'm called to help him, to look after him, to keep my house clean, to look after my kids and my grandkids. That's what I'm called to do. And I'm happy in that state. I know that's my calling. I don't desire to be on a platform and preach all the time, not at all. So I think if you find your place in your home, don't be ashamed of it. Don't feel this is inadequate what I do. I feel if you're a plumber or an electrician or whatever you're doing, if that's what God called you to, be content in it. Say, I'll do it, be the best plumber, I'll be the best wife, I'll be the best mother that I can be, and that will make your home happy and your marriage blessed if you content yourself in that. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, just before I mention Ruth Ann here, I just want to give a little testimony. I knew when I was marrying Maureen, 100% I was in God's will, and we were in God's will. And from that day to this, she's been my queen. She is number one, my queen. And I just want her to know again, honey, I love you more than words can say. And I'm glad that we're together and we will be even over there, we'll still rejoice in our wonderful Savior. And thank you for all the tremendous blessing you've been to me, our children and our grandchildren. A big cheer for Maureen, please. Thank you.